Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for giving us these words. Um, these words that, that express sorrow and pain, questions that maybe some of us have had, um, yet you preserve them by the power of your Spirit um, for us today. So God, I pray that, um, yeah, for those of us who maybe are going through a tough time, that you would help us process these emotions biblically. Um, God, for those of us who, who maybe are, as, as Romans said, rejoicing that, that we would still be able to weep with those who weep. Um, God, I pray that um, we would just get a biblical framework for what it is to lament. Um, yeah, Lord, be with us these next few minutes. Help us focus on the text. Let, let the point of the text be the, the point of the sermon and let us walk away just enamored and in love with Jesus more than anything else. For he is our man of sorrows who acquainted himself with our grief for our good and for your glory. So it's in his name that we can come, his name that we ask you to do these things, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, for the next few weeks, we're going to examine biblical lament. And, and I know it doesn't seem like a, a very jolly or rosy topic, um, but it's important, right? Because I, I think if you read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, which takes up two-thirds of the Bible, lament is, is important. It's, it's almost central to God's people, right? If, if you guys think about the two big movements in the Old Testament, the exodus and the exile, those are dark seasons that, that the people of God lamented, right? And so through their time in exile, which, which I'm going to get more into the context of this next week when we open up Lamentations, um, but the, the Jewish people would actually use the book of Lamentations and various lament psalms to process their emotions, to process their thoughts, their feelings. In fact, later, so that was, the, the exile was right after the first temple was destroyed. Well, when the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD, some early Christians and, and Jews in the first century would actually use the same book of Lamentations to pray back to God. Why is this happening? Why is this going on? And so if, if you read scripture, you'll see that, that the idea of lament is it's, it's an integral part of the community of faith in the Bible. But I know for us in our Western culture, right, that we don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about expressing all this emotion or, or, or crying in front of someone. Like th those things are weak. And in some sense, in some circles, and I would even say some churches, that's frowned upon. Like, we don't know what to do in community group when somebody comes in and we say, how can we pray for you? What's going on in your life? And they just unload their baggage. You're just like, well, I don't, should, should we call a pastor to meet with them? Like, I, I don't know what to do with this, right? We don't know how to process this. And, and I don't know whether it's because we just love superficiality that much, or maybe it's, it's because we don't want to be seen as weak, to other people. We want to seem like we have it all together, right? Jesus is our victory, right? So, so why would we feel sorrow? I, I don't know what it is, but whatever the reason, the, our, our culture today, specifically the Christian culture in America especially, we've lost that ability and we've lost this, this important component of lamenting. We, we don't want to even talk about it. I mean, if you take some of the, the major hymnals out of any of the big denominations— and, and you kind of break down what percentage of those songs are psalms of lament. Here's what you would find. In the Church of Christ hymnal, 13% of their psalms are about, are, are lament songs, right? In the Presbyterian hymnal, they do a little better. They're up to 19%. 19% of the Presbyterian, which you guys are going, that's pretty amazing. The Baptist hymnal, 
13% of the Baptist hymnal are lament songs. Now, that sounds like a lot, but if, if you read the Psalms, 40% of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. 40%. The meaning, half of the time that God, God gave us this book of, of worship songs for us to sing, so it says in the New Testament, sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs to each other. He gives us these songs to sing, and almost half of them are songs of sorrow, psalms of lament. And so I'm sitting here, and I'm like, okay, what's not adding up, right? Like I compare our hymnal to essentially God's hymnal in the psalms, and I'm like, why isn't this, why are we not comfortable with the clearly biblical practice? Why don't we talk about it? And so I think what, what I've started to discover as, as I've studied more and more and I've talked with Jim and Robert about the idea of tackling a topic like lament, I'm like, we need to discover and some of us maybe rediscover the, the beauty of biblical lament. And so before we get into lamentations, we're going to do Psalm 13 because this psalm, I picked this specifically because this is a psalm that's like vague enough that it just shows us what lament is. And actually, as, as you research this psalm, this is almost a psalm that was given. It's early in the book, and it's fairly vague, so that it could be a template that many people can just pick up, personalize it to their lives, and pray it to God. And so it's literally given to us almost as a template on how to lament. So what we'll see in these three stanzas, these six verses, is kind of four movements. The first one's kind of assumed, all right? So the first movement in this journey of lament is to turn to God, right? It's to pray. It's simply to pray. The first thing that we see that the psalmist does is he turns to God in prayer. Now, some of you guys might not see this as some huge, mind-blowing revelation. They're like, oh, wow, that's how the psalm starts. He's talking to God, right? That, that doesn't seem like this huge thing, but, but think about your times of hurt or heartache, I mean, think about it. Linda just said, I didn't want to talk to God. I mean, you guys have probably felt, I know I have. There are times where I said, you know what? Talking about it is the last thing I want to do. And I'm an external processor, right? So, so if, if I don't want to talk about it, I don't know how my internal processors and introverts are dealing with that. They're like, I don't even want to think about it. I just want to block it out. I don't want to have to deal with this. Especially when we feel, and, and we'll get into the psalm, when we feel like God is the one who's betrayed us, it's hard then to turn to him in prayer. When we go, but if, if God has done this to me, who can I even turn to? It's, it's really hard for us to turn to prayer when we're in pain. And so it is a miracle that David, that the psalmist here, can actually turn to God in prayer. It's amazing. It's so easy to be silent, but, but being silent is detrimental in our times of sorrow, in our hard times. Why, why is that? This is, this is why. One, one author puts it this way. He says, giving, the, giving God the silent treatment is the ultimate manifestation of unbelief. Giving God the silent treatment is the ultimate manifestation of unbelief. Here's why. Despair lives under the hopeless resignation that God just doesn't care. He doesn't hear, and nothing's ever going to change. People who believe that stop praying, right? Like, like if, if I, I, I say this all the time, the reason we come to God in prayer is because we believe he can do something about it, right? That's why we pray. And so as, as hard as it seems, like we can't not turn to him knowing what we know about him, about who he is. Because when we remember who God is, there's nowhere else we can turn. There's nowhere else we can turn. And so we turn to him precisely because we trust him. We, we, we pray precisely because, okay, he's been good in the past. His track record is flawless. He's, he's been faithful every single time, and so I know I can come to him. I know I can. And if I didn't think that God was faithful, I didn't think he was sovereign, I wouldn't pray. And so we turn to him, even when sometimes we can't feel, I mean, read the Psalms where, where David says, I'll tell my soul to bless the Lord. Like, I don't feel it, I need to tell myself to turn to the Lord and praise his holy name. And so when we turn to him, now what do we say? Let, let's, let's get into this Psalm. The first two verses show us that we are supposed to complain to God. 
we're supposed to complain to God. That's point number two, complain to God, verses one and two. And if you look at it, notice there's four complaints here, right? Four questions he asks of God. Four questions. Some, some kind of crisis is going on in his life, and so he complains. And his complaints, they're theological, they're, they're personal, and they're social. I mean, it's all-encompassing, right? Notice in verse one, the you complaint against God. That's the theological complaint. He says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And then he turns inward. And notice the I complaint about himself. This shows the personal sorrow, the personal complaint, the personal question. How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? And then he turns outward and he says, look around, right? This is the they complain against his enemies. This is the social aspect here. How long shall my enemies be exalted over me? I mean, it's all encompassing. It's upward, it's inward, it's outward. It's all around. There's problems, there's crisis going on. Now, I'm, I'm sure if, if you guys go, okay, well, that's not fully just God or internal, right? Some of this kind of bleeds over. It, it, it helps me to see just how encompassing it is, even though you can't really compartmentalize all of that because like the, the you complain and they complains have I elements in them, right? And so, so it's, it's this, these relationships that make up the psalmist's existence, they, they can't really be compartmentalized. They can't. Rather, his problems with his enemies, his problems within himself are problems he ultimately has with God. And so he brings that to God. I mean, and and we'll see, if you guys look at those four questions that start with how long, how long, how long, how long, they intensify. They actually staircase both in subject matter and literarily. Look at this. In verse 1a, so the beginning of verse 1, he accuses God of forgetting him. He says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? And then at the end of verse one, he he suggests that God is guilty of neglecting him and withdrawing from him. Now he's starting to really put an accusation against God. And then at the beginning of verse two, this, this general sense of abandonment out there, it's internalized, right? The length, even the length of the complaint grows. In, in the first line, it's five Hebrew words. Then the second line, it's six Hebrew words. Then you get to the beginning of verse two, it's eight Hebrew words. He's saying it's like the staircase effect that's building and he's suggesting that, that the longer this continues, the longer I think about it and dwell on it, it starts to penetrate me and it's growing. That's what he's doing here. And then, at the end of verse 2, the sense of crisis is even more increased by this introduction of some enemy. I don't know who it is, but there's an enemy now in play. And so it's not just God has abandoned him, but God's handed him over to the hands of people who are opposed to God. And so the psalmist, I mean, this is the psalmist's outrage, right? This is what he's, he's building to. He says God's abandoned him into the hands of an enemy into people who are opposed to God. Now that seems bold, right? And some of you guys will go, well, I would never come to God like that, right? Well, the, the beauty of the Psalms is that they're given to us for exactly that, right? Is that they're given to us exactly for that. And, and that's what, some of you guys might feel bad even complaining to God, let alone accusing him of something, but, but that's what the scriptures show us and teach us what to do. I, I, I grab my pain in one hand and God's character in the other and go, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't match up, right? Like, like I know God is good. My life is bad. What's the disconnect? Why isn't this going on? He, he says he would do this, but I'm not seeing that now, so I start asking questions. I'm like, God, what are you doing? Why do I feel this way? Why are people all around me doing X, Y, and Z? It's, it's all encompassing. He's, he's, and, and this is where the, we have this conflict of living in a fallen world, knowing the goodness of God, knowing what's to come in the new heavens and new earth. We feel this pain. We feel this tension. That's why we read Romans 8 earlier. The sufferings of this world aren't to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed. Yep, yeah, okay. Great, but what do I do now about that? And so I start to wrestle with that. 
I hold up my pain, I hold up God's character, I say, this makes no sense. And that's exactly how the psalmist comes. It's not, well, clean your life up, put on a happy face, and then you can go to church. It's, no, no, bring your sorrow, bring your baggage, bring your hurts, bring your complaints, your frustrations, and come to him. Now, I'm not saying this is all we say to God, but we must say this to God, right? So we can't skip this step, but we're not just going to camp out on this step and stay there, okay? Because there's, there's more to the psalm than just verses 1 and 2. But there is a danger, though, in just jumping to verse 3 or jumping to verse 5 and skipping over what happens in verses 1 and 2. Because if we move too quickly from our hurts to our requests, we skip over the necessary process of dealing with our pain. Meaning, if we look for quick fixes, what we're going to find is quick and empty solutions, right? I mean, it's the difference of like, if, if you have a pipe that bursts at home, duct tape might hold it for a day or a week, but ultimately you need a new pipe. You need to deal with it. You need to take care of it. And because if, if we go from our, our quick fixes, right, we find empty promises, empty solutions, it's ultimately going to end in empty praise. I mean, think about it, right? If the other day I was tired, and I said, what would do me better? For me to drink a pot of coffee or for me to take a nap? Now, most of you guys know this, right? Really, you should say, Michael, what, really, what you really need is a good night of sleep, right? Deal with the actual problem of why you're tired because you're up too much or you stay up too late or you wake up too early or you do this or you do that. Not, not oh, just drink some coffee and just keep going on. That's a quick fix. And we all know who has had caffeine crashes before I mean, you feel great, and then you, you're worse than where you started. That's what quick fixes do. And so we have to process through. We have to build in healthy rhythms that will actually give rest to our souls. And the same is true here, right? We need to deal with our problems, not just skip over them. So by definition of what a request is to God, before we get on to that in verses 3 and 4, a request to God comes out of a place of me saying, it's not okay. That's why I'm asking. If things were fine, I wouldn't be asking you anything. They, so they assume, they presume a sense of sin, a sense of pain, a sense of calamity or brokenness. And then we come to a point where we see God as the only one who can help. And here's the best part. He listens. This is the best part, right? No, no hurt is too burdensome for God to tend to, right? And, and I can't look around and compare myself and start discrediting my pain because someone else is going through something harder. We're going to get through that in Lamentations 1 and 2. Because even if I sin against God, I mean, read Psalm 51. David literally murdered someone so that he could commit adultery with the guy's wife, and then he lies about it. And then what does he do? He comes to God and God hears him. That's the beauty of the Lord. That's the beauty of the Lord that we can come to him whether we're feeling guilty or just beat up, right? Whether we're exhausted or just full of complaints and questions, we can come and bring our burdens and our tears and lay them at the throne of grace where we'll find rest. That's the beauty of who God is, right? We're not called to just paint smiley faces on all of our sorrow. That's, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to boldly approach his throne and cast everything on him. Why? Because he cares for us. So here's how we complain, right? We, we come humbly. We pray God's word back to him. That's, that's why we're going through scripture. That's why I made that, that packet available back there. So you can just pray God's words that he gave us back to him. You can process your emotions, your feelings, your hurts, your everything through scripture. And come honestly, right? I mean, look at the complaints again in verse one and two. Come honestly to the Lord. Say, this is how I feel. But don't just complain, right? Don't just complain. Notice what he does next. In verse three and four, he asks of God. He asks God something. And this is where he goes from how long, which is like kind of saying, why is this happening? He moves from the why to the who, right? He moves from the why to the who. And this is where we see complaint turn into request. And notice this connection. It's, it's not just me going, well, logically, that's the next thing that happens, if you look, 
There's repetition in the first two verses, right? How long, how long, how long, how long? If you look at verse three and four, you actually see a different type of repetition, but it's all of these action verbs that he puts forth. Consider me, answer me, illuminate my eyes. Three times he says, God, act, act, act. Do something about this. And then he asks God to move in massive ways, absolutely massive ways. You guys can, can read that in, in the packet. All of the asks, the requests that we can ask of the Lord. Some of those are, are big, bold questions to ask the Lord to do. But I want you to notice something, okay? Look at verse one and two next to verse three and four. The beginning of verse three fits with verse one, okay? Because in verse one, we see the psalmist complains about God, right? How, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Look at the first line of verse three. Consider me and answer me, O oh Lord, my God. So he's talking about God at the beginning. Then next in the stanza, he talks about himself. He says, how long must I take counsel in, the, in my own soul and have sorrow all the day? And he even plays off of God hiding his face from him and says, light up my eyes that I might see. In the end of verse two, how long should my enemy be exalted over me? Look at verse four, lest my enemy say, I've prevailed over him. So he's linking, what, what you should see here is the link between the, the complaints and the requests. Every complaint he has, he doesn't just leave in the complaint box. He turns them into requests of God. And what you'll see too is if you look at verse three, the first, it, you'll, you'll kind of see in the first line, you'll see two requests and one reason, right? And then the next line, you'll see one request, one reason. And then at the end, you'll see no requests and all reasons, which he's basically, he's intensifying again, right? You guys are probably thinking, okay, Michael, you're really nerding out on Hebrew poetry here, right? Maybe, um, but this structure matters, right? Because the, the mirroring structure here is emphasizing that all of his problems that he has are theological problems. It's not just personal, oh, well, David feels this way. He's really sad. Let me show you in this beautiful poetry how sad I am. No, he's saying all of my problems are ultimately and fundamentally theological. They all come back to the question of my life is this way, God is this way, why doesn't this make sense? That's what it all boils down to. His real distress in which he utters his groans are that he feels separated from God. And that's what he's trying to express here, right? And he feels like he's facing God's wrath, but he knows even in the face of facing God's wrath, his only hope is to turn to him. He knows that. He says, the only thing I can do is come to him because even though I feel like God's turned away from me, he is the only one who holds the answer. He's the only one who holds the answer. And so because he understands that God stands at the center of his crisis, he knows that God is the only one who can deliver him from that crisis. You get that connection, right? You have to see that. And so that's why we come, right? That's why we're commanded to come. Remember what we read at the beginning of service. Hebrews 4, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Why? So that we might receive mercy in our time of need. Because our high priest, Jesus, he is familiar with our suffering. He's sympathetic to our suffering. That's what Hebrews goes on to say. In other words, we ask boldly because Jesus understands deeply. He does. I mean, he, he's the man of sorrows who acquainted himself with our grief. I mean, okay, we just spent, what, like eight years in Matthew, right? You guys are laughing, right? No, we spent a year and a half. But anyways, as we went through Matthew, you should have noticed how many statements of Jesus were linked to the Psalms, specifically the Psalms of Lament. You can't gloss over the fact that at the most climactic moment of salvation history, what does Jesus say in Matthew's gospel? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's straight out of Psalm 22. Straight out of scripture, he prays a psalm of lament. You can't gloss over that, right? Jesus lamented and expressed 
experienced pain in unimaginable ways. Unimaginable ways. He was forsaken by God, truly forsaken by God. Why? So that you and I might be accepted by him. Like, that's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus just didn't do this to show us, oh, well, he's a great example of how you should face your sorrows, your sufferings. Think about it this way. If Jesus hadn't suffered, we would still be in our sins, right? If, if he hadn't lamented, we would still be hopeless. If, if Jesus didn't experience death and the wrath of God, we would never experience life and the pleasure of God. He had to go through that, right? So Jesus' sufferings aren't just to show us, oh, well, you have a friend in time of need. Yes, we do, that's true, but it's so much more than that. His sufferings are the very reason we can come to God and have access to him. We can go straight to him through Christ. And when we come, what do we find but a tender savior who says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, for I am gentle, and lowly in heart. Come to me. He can sympathize with us. And, and here's the thing. Not only can he sympathize with us, but also he can deliver us. The cross wasn't just to show us, well, now you can lament with purpose. No, that liberated us from our sins, from death, from bondage, right? So we need to see both God's love and his power here. We have to see that just collide at the cross because there we'll see a savior who is both tender and sovereign, right? He can comfort us in our pain and in our sorrow and in our suffering and he can deliver us from sin and he can do one because he did the other, right? You have to see that link there. So whether you're hurting today, you don't know Jesus, I don't know where all of you are, Come to him today because that's the God that you will find. You will find rest for your souls because he is gentle and lowly in heart. And because of that, he's worthy to be praised. Notice how the psalmist ends there in verse five and six. That's exactly what he does in the last section of this psalm. We see this, verse five and six show us to trust God. Trust God, that's point number four. It's our final point, trust God. Now notice how the lament turns. Now, I think this is the last literary thing I'm gonna point out to you guys. Um, notice the first word of verse five, what does it say? What does it say? But, but. So right there, a shift is happening. A turn is happening. With that little word but, we see a gigantic shift. A gigantic shift. And what's fascinating is, for the rest of the psalm, he doesn't even bring up his enemies. He leaves his enemies behind. He leaves his crisis behind. We see this entire shift happen here, and he moves now to trust in God's fidelity and praise God for his mercy. The grief that's filled with lament, it, it's still there. It's still there. But something else amazing has happened and God has heard him. God has inclined his ear to him. Moreover, God has had mercy on the psalmist and that's where the psalmist turns. And we see him respond with this three-dimensional theological perspective, right? We see him look back, we see him look where he is, and we see him look forward, all right? He looks, he looks back to yesterday he looks today with eyes wide open about what's going around and he looks forward, hopefully, for tomorrow. Notice this, at the beginning of verse five, we see kind of in this trusting God, we see three things that the, that the psalmist says he'll do. Number one, he says, I'll trust, right? This is an active patience. He says, but I've trusted in your steadfast love. Now that word steadfast love is the Hebrew word chesed, which is God's faithfulness that he's proven to himself proven to his people generation after generation rooted in his character of who he is. And so we see this trust, it's not just an entry point into prayer, but it's also the very heartbeat and the very destination of the prayer, right? It's rooted in God's track record, his steadfast love. The psalmist says, I know that God is trustworthy, so he must be worthy of my trust. So I must trust him. He connects his painful experience then to God's hesed love. 
God's steadfast love. And, and this is what it is to be a Christian, right? John Piper said this once. He said, to be a Christian is to keep trusting the one who keeps us trusting, right? We keep trusting the one who keeps us trusting. And so that's what we must do. So he says, I've trusted in your steadfast love. The next line, he says, my heart shall rejoice. So he moves from past tense, I've trusted to present tense. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. We rejoice because God saved us. It's it's that simple. We rejoice in salvation. Now, this is not to minimize our pain or dismiss our pain or downplay anything that's going on, but rather what it does is it puts that into perspective, saying God has not forgotten us or rejected us when we suffer. In fact, through our suffering, he's using these things to make us more like Jesus, right? Again, we gotta go back to the cross. This is the only way we can rejoice because there we have the full story of salvation, There we have the full story of salvation. You need to remember, the ultimate cry of lament at the cross led to the greatest moment of redemption. You can't can't separate those two. There's no cross without the sorrow. There's just not. And so we have to live in this weird tension of our pain and God's promises with joy. That's what Paul tells the people in 2 Corinthians. He says, we are sorrowful yet always rejoicing. I'm like, man, I feel that one. We're sorrowful yet always rejoicing. And then finally, we see the psalmist say, I will sing to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord. And this is something he kind of turns forward to. This is what I'll do going on from here on out. And this is how we, we tune our hearts, right? So that we can sing about trust. We've, we, we move from these pointed questions through the request, ultimately, to God-centered worship. That's what it all comes down to, right? All of the biblical laments, they lead to this destination of faith-filled worship. And, and, and that's why I love talking about the, the tough and difficult psalms, the psalms of lament, lamentations itself, because lamentations and, and lament psalms are given to us so that we might shape our affections our desires, our perceptions of the world, and so I can start to learn, as Robert prayed earlier, let me lament over what the Lord laments over, that that people are lost and don't know him. Let let me lament over the sin that I feel, the sin that I've committed. Let me be broken over that. David says, create in me a clean spirit, O God. Right? Let, Let me love what you love and hate what you hate, that that's what Scripture's given to us for. In that sense, we need to start aligning our heart to God's. And and when we sing, this is the beauty of what we sing, and this is why I love, we don't turn the lights off or blare the speakers because we want you guys to see each other, hear each other. We, when we come together and we sing as a congregation, we are protesting against the death and the suffering of this world, lifting our voices, confessing our trust in God, saying we know what's to come. That's why we sing. That's why we sing. You can't be sad and sing. We we bring our hurts, we bring our sorrows, we bring our pain, and they all get released at the cross. They all get released at the feet of Jesus. So you need to see this three-dimensional kind of theological perspective he ends with here in verses five and six. He looks backwards, acknowledging, in your hesed love, I've trusted. In your steadfast love, I've trusted. And so today he confesses, I shall rejoice in your salvation. And of tomorrow, or for now, us 10 minutes from now, we will say, let, let's, let's vow to sing to the Lord. Let's sing to the Lord. Why? Because he's dealt bountifully with us. He's dealt so, bount- like, that's why I can trust. That's how you can trust. That's how you can rejoice because he's dealt bountifully with you. That's how you can sing, because he's dealt bountifully with you. Lament gives us the grace to keep trusting, keep rejoicing, and keep singing. And so, to kind of bring this back to our culture and and our kind of, why don't we lament the way that scripture does, we might think that lament is antithetical to a relationship with God. But what we should see in this psalm 
is, is that it's not antithetical to a covenant relationship with God. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. To lament is to be Christian, right? To lament is to be Christian. To cry is human, but to lament is Christian. You understand that? Because you have to go through this journey in this true covenant relationship. We have the freedom to take up these complaints and requests, bring them to the throne of grace where we ultimately trust and we ultimately find our worship. And there, right, there in that space of lament, we are able to take initiative with God as he gives us grace to do so. But where we don't lament, and this this is what I really want to caution you guys against doing, where we don't lament, where that's absent, we're left left with this like false sense of self almost. This sense that, well, everything's okay, or I'll figure it out. And that's not faith, right? That's pride. That's pride. That's, that's, that's based in fear, based in guilt. And, and, and what happens is when we view God as unable or unwilling to help us, we reduce religion or our relationship with God down to this resentful, self-deceptive exchange of goods and services, works of righteousness. That's what we ultimately do. Meaning that the absence of lament makes a religion of coercive obedience as the only possibility. And so therefore, lament, all of lament, complaints, requests, everything, it's not the opposite of faith, but it's part and parcel of what faith is. It's part and parcel of that. And so this is why I say we need to discover, rediscover lament. This is why I took an entire week to go through Psalm 13 before we get into the book of Lamentations. Because we, as Christians in this broken world, we need to know how to wrestle, how to interact, how to process the, the, the pains and the sorrow and the suffering of this world and in our lives with the beauty and the truth of God and how those live in tension until we're with him forever. And so my prayer for you this morning is this, that you would cherish this gift of lament, not just see it as some weird, uncomfortable thing. I hope even you guys in your community groups this week, you can process through laments, you can process through, what is it to lament? I mean, I was talking with Jake earlier this week. He said, Michael, this thing in my life happened, so I just took out a pen and pad and, and my Bible next to it, and I just started writing my own lament. And he was like, and it's, it's, it's crazy where I was emotionally before and where I ended at the end of it all. So process through that, because when you're confronted with pain, we need to respond in prayer. We have to. We have to turn to God. We can bring our complaints to him humbly and honestly, praying his word back to him, and then ask him, say, do something about it, God. Do something about it. And then finally, we let our hearts rest in him. We can't skip any of those steps. We have to go through all of them. And I hope that, that the journey of lament would just plunge you guys deeper and deeper into the depth of God's love. Let me pray for us this morning.